Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maria Tileli. I am a, a, an anesthetist a trainee in uh, Athens. Um, we're very pleased to have you uh, here with us. This is the first webinar out of four created by the Ezra trainee uh, uh, group. Um, uh, it would be a, a series of uh, webinars uh, breaking down um, regional anesthesia training. Um, we are very happy to um, kick off our first session with um, two uh, presentations. Uh, the first one would be by um, Clara Lobo, a consultant anesthetist, uh, a newsletter um, a committee uh, member and editor of the uh, uh, newsletter um, uh, group as well, and an Ezra ambassador. Uh, the presentation would be about what every trainee should know about regional anesthesia. And we will be uh, continuing the presentation uh, by Alexandros Macris, uh, consultant, uh, um, EDRA uh, examiner and EDRA board member and abstract committee member. Uh, we will be presenting how to, um, what we do we need to know before we perform uh, our first block uh, as trainees or novice trainees. Um, before we begin, I would like to remind you that you can answer, you can um, ask all your questions by clicking the button, the question and answer button at the bottom of the screen. So, uh, handing you over to Clara. Hi, Maria. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's also a pleasure to be the chair of Ezra webinars and see that uh, it's been a good feature that Ezra started and uh, it's become very popular. Uh, and I'm so I welcome everyone. And uh, so we don't know without more delays. Let me start my presentation. So um, I don't want to mislead you, but uh, this is what I think about how this talk should be. So how trainees should become after training regional anesthesia. So my name is Clara Lobo. I am a, a consultant um, of anesthesiology. I was Ezra Secretary General from 2019 to 2022. And I want to give my, I want to recognize all anesthesiologists that dedicate their life to learning, to teaching original anesthesia. They deserve my deepest respects, my full admiration, because this requires a lot of work, a lot of dedication, a lot of, a lot of resilience. Thank you, and thank you for keeping me inspired every day. Uh, so um, this panel of experts wrote in this uh, historical paper 12 years ago, in spite, and in spite of the warning of being inaccurate, I truly feel its essence is very much current. But I share the feelings that uh, I also fear of being out of date and inaccurate in the future, considering the content of this talk. So when we talk about training and teaching, what comes to mind of everyone is to study. And study means like having your books, your papers, and all that with you. But also, and I have to um, share this with you, that uh, in many times for me studying, uh, it's like texting, eating, watching TV, and having this textbook open next to me. <laughs> so when, in, when initially learning um, uh, ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia, it's common for residents to focus primarily on hands-on aspects of the technique. However, technical competency alone does not result in proficiency. Either learning um, general anesthesia or regional anesthesia, we should aim for SICA. SICA means skills, experience, knowledge, and most of all, in my opinion, is the attitude. Uh, these are the bricks leading to competence and ultimately to proficiency. Um, there are major sorry, Dr. Lobo, we have a problem with your with your uh, screen. I'm sorry. Sorry. We have a problem with your share screen. Oh. Just a minute. Because I'm not sharing, I'm sorry. Yes, you, you were sharing, but we were stuck in the first slide for some reasons. Okay. Can Are you, you try sharing? again? Yes. Yes? 
Okay, cool. Do you want me to go back or should I just keep going? If you can just go back to the, to the previous slide, just to make sure that's working properly. This one? Yeah, now it's working. Thank you. Okay. So what I was telling you is that um, learning means different things or several things. Um, wait a moment. I'm having some problem with my screen. I don't know why. Okay. So it means first we should look for Sika or, or it means that it, the skills, experience and knowledge are important. But I think that all of these three, thing, three things um, will not work because if you don't have an attitude and you need the attitude and the will to actually put this into motion. There are major challenges in teaching and assessing skills expected from practicing anesthesiologists and residents in anesthesia training programs. Implementing appropriate technical actions like technical performance and manifesting appropriate crisis solving is not enough for the perfect performance. You need to develop and practice anesthesia non-technical behaviors. And this we can divide in two dimensions. First, that the cognitive or mental skills this means decision-making, planning strategy, risk assessment, situation awareness, and also the social or interpers interpersonal effective skills like how to work in, is, as a team, the communication, the leadership. And lapsed or deficient non-technical cognitive skills can easily lead to cognitive errors in anesthesia. The good news is that ANTS, the uh, anesthesia non-technical skills, can be taught and can be trained. So the residents of today will be the specialists of tomorrow. So I think that we need to keep good leaders in the future to come and, for, and that will start in residency for sure. The progression is not the same for everyone. There are some that progress in supersonic speed and others that might need more, some more time. It's not important to step the step length of, or the pace that your progression for of your progression to proficiency, as long as you keep moving, as you need to keep moving forward. No, no matter the pace, no matter the speed, just keep moving forward. You need to know a lot of things. But as important as the amount of knowledge you can accumulate is the need to learn, practice and train the coordination of your knowledge and incorporate it in your practice and in your culture. The Ezra and Azra panel that developed the recommendations for education and training in, in uh, ultrasound guided regional anesthesia defined 10 tasks that you can see here on the bottom of the slide. These 10 tasks should be learned so that you can have a good performance in regional anesthesia. I encourage you to read the recommendation as they present a very concise way of how you can develop your training and uh, your training as a resident uh, or a fellow and how you can develop your training program if you are a chair of a, a program uh, of red, uh, or developing a program of residency or a program for developing a fellowship in regional anesthesia. Competencies like medical knowledge, like uh, patient care, like system-based practice or practice-based learning, professionalism, interpersonal. So these tools can be used to consolidate more competencies. They, as, so the tools that to be used to consolidate core competencies are didactics, simulation, and clinical experience. Specific topics like clinical pharmacology and risks and contraindications of regional anesthesia can be covered through didactics. Other tasks and skills like aseptic technique, monitoring of vital signs and patient comfort, management of complex patients or complications, and coordination of care with other healthcare providers can be learned through clinical experience. Although simulation training has not been studied extensively for non-technical ultrasound-guided skills, 
Residents can practice providing informed consent, for example, explaining post-procedural care and discussing management of complications. Additionally, simulation can be used to teach situational awareness, multitasking and teamwork during crisis and develop an uh, approach to managing ultrasound guided regional anesthesia complications. Several options are available for establishing a practitioner to begin to acquire the skill sets associated with this kind of techniques. You can start by practicing in accredited events, practice ultrasound scanning techniques and learn sonoanatomy by imaging oneself and colleagues. Practice needle insertion techniques using simulators and phantoms. Spend time with experienced individuals observing and learning techniques and incorporate ultrasound into a pre-existing regional anesthetic practice. To successfully perform a triad of distinct but interrelated skills is required image acquisition, anatomical interpretation, and hand-eye coordination. There are several ways to kick you know, your wish and you, to boost your knowledge and learning like gamification. Game design elements that endorse competition, recognition of accomplishments, and social interaction can foster motiva motivation and provide a positive reward system. The synergistic effect of training combined with elements of success, rewards, and social recognition can benefit learners by increasing engagement, productivity, content learning, knowledge retention, and collaboration. For graduate medical education, gamification can create a fun learning environment, enhance resident training at various stages of learning, and serve as a method of assessing core competencies. Here's another publication that I recommend you to read. It was the starting point to recognize the need to define which basic regional anesthesia technique should be part of a basic curriculum, how to disseminate competence and implement pathways. Recognizing obstacles is a major st step to find viable solutions. These are the blocks suggested by the authors. There may be room for debate considering which would be the basic blocks to be taught, uh, but this could be a new lecture uh, to have in the future and uh, I'm sure that will um, cause a lot of debate and discussion. Here is, there are three um, examples of recent publications that I really advise you to download and read. Some of them are uh, open, open access. And it will be, it will, it's meant to be a guide of how to document your blogs and recommendations for the anatomical uh, identification of basic blocks and more advanced or intermediate blocks uh, ultrasound guided. Here when performance is measured, perf uh, when performance is measured, in performance improves. When performance is measured and reported, the rate of improvement accelerates. And how can you do that? You can do that, for example, by uh, putting your uh, your knowledge um, to, to challenge your knowledge by uh, attending or trying to have some exams. Uh, Ezra has uh, two very well-established exams, like ADPM, if you are interested in pain medicine, or EDRA, if you are inter interested in regional anesthesia. This is also good to test, not only to test your knowledge, but also to boost your uh, learning and uh, to give you some uh, curriculum if you want to, you know, uh, apply for several uh, positions or even to improve your uh, scaling uh, in terms of knowledge and recognition. Simulation. Simulation has been utilized for training in a wide range of medical fields and it is an effective educational tool for acquiring knowledge and skills gaining hands-on experience through a repetitive practice without harm to patients and receiving individualized feedback. 
It also allows you to uh, train yourself in rare conditions uh, or rare situations or situations with a uh, uh, severe outcome. The, the advantages of the simulation in ultrasound guided regional anesthesia include the shortening of learning curve, allowing residents to learn at their individual rate and improving block success. Additional benefits of simulation training include learning non-technical skills, and as, as I said before, and the creation of a low-stress environment for learning. Simulation can also be used to teach certain skills like situation awareness, multitasking, teamwork during crisis, and management. And standardized simulated scenarios can allow residents to develop an approach to managing complications. This approach has been used by Ezra in our Ezra residence course in Porto. Here is a small example of uh, how, um, or in a short preview of what we are doing in Ezra, using simulation as a major for major and minor complications in regional anesthesia. I can give you an overview of the scenarios, and it's very vivid and lively. Uh, the scenarios that we have are mostly pneumothorax, you know, total spinal, peripheral nerve block catheter failure, compartment syndrome, last, PDPH, epidural hematoma, nerve damage, and others under, under development that we are uh, putting together for you. Uh, the next one uh, will be uh, in April, the 21st and 27th, also in Porto. And I think uh, the registrations will be, are open or will be open soon. Oops. So, and um, this is uh, our final aim. When you start working on your own and you are confident regional anesthetist, this is what we want when we train you in regional anesthesia. And allow me to give you some advice instead of take home messages. And um, this is how I try to keep me moving forward. Stay foolish stay hungry, stay foolish, stay foolish to keep a certain degree of craziness because we all need some crazy in our life and stay hungry, hungry for knowledge, for practice, for experiences. And let me just close my presentation, invite you to be there in September um, to our uh, annual Congress and Ezra World Congress of Regional Anesthesia and Pen Medicine. Thank you all for your attention, and I will just close my sharing screen. So, hello from me too. Hello, dear colleagues. I'm Alexios Macris from Greece and from Athens. I'm very happy to participate in a webinar for trainees, uh, teaching trainees, teaching younger doctors is what keeps us energetic and up to date. Together, we will see what we need to know before we perform my first, our first blog. Actually, there are a lot of things to know, as Clara already said, but we will try to place them in a nutshell. I have nothing to disclose for this presentation. First, we have to look back to the peripheral nerve blocks history. In the period between 1884, when the first ophthalmic block was described by Kohler in Vienna and the 70s, the greatest achievements in regional anesthesia, despite, of course, the introduction of subarachnoid anesthesia by Pierre, were the passage from cocaine to modern local anesthetics and the introduction of peripheral nerve blocks using surface landmarks back then. The induction of paesthesia indicated a good distance between the needle tip and the nerve, and the success rates were high, at least in the hands of the experienced. In the mid-90s, the nerve stimulator became a very useful clinical tool. And later on, in 1994, the first block under nerve visualization, approximately the same way we perform it today, was described by Capra. The following decade was dedicated in establishing the new technique as for its feasibility and the description of several approaches for the main peripheral nerve blocks. During the last decade, the ultrasound technology improved a lot the investigators started experimenting with deeper structures, peripheral nerve catheters were introduced using ultrasound guidance, and we anesthesiologists became acquainted with, uh, with the advantages, but at the same time with the limitation of the new technique. A famous quote by the correspondence of British Anesthesiologist says, 
that regional anesthesia always works if you put the right dose of the right drug in the right place. In order to achieve this seemingly easy uh, thing uh, and, and benefit the most from regional anesthesia, we have to be properly trained. What is this SODOTO? It is an acronym. It is an acronym for C1, do one, teach one. It has been a traditional method dating back from the 1800s, firstly used in medical surgery teaching hospitals in order for interns to gain knowledge, understanding, and to practice in surgical skills. Is it valid today? No. It can be valid. Uh, the interns don't deserve that. And uh, most of all, patients don't deserve that. It increases the responsibilities of uh, trainees, but it raises major concerns regarding the patient's safety. It has been reported that inadequate knowledge, inadequate experience, and inadequate supervision of trainees uh, are among the main causes of medical mistakes. In critical incidents analysis in anesthesia, the human error has been involved in 82% of preventable incidents. <clears throat> in the list of recommended corrective uh, actions to avoid mistakes, high in the list appears the correction of training issues of residents. So, based on several modern skill uh, learning models, uh, Kessler and Associates uh, suggested a six-stage teaching model to learn uh, uh, ultrasound guided regional anesthesia. Started with knowledge of anatomy, followed by knowledge of basic ultrasound and device principles, followed by practice on hands-on workshops, not only uh, in seminars and congresses, but also to each other, to colleagues and friends, needling phantoms, needling cadaver workshops before applying blocks on real patients under supervision. The knowledge of the anatomy is the base of the, uh, of the learning pyramid for regional anesthesia, because regional anesthesia is actually applied anatomy, like surgery. We see and we block what we already know by our anatomical knowledge that is there. The ultrasound guidance marked the end of the blind techniques and methods in regional anesthesia. It can be used either alone or together with uh, nerve stimulation, the so-called dual guidance. That is important, for example, in deeper situated structures where we cannot see the nerves. We use landmark so-called shadow gates other than nerves like arteries, bones, tendons. We direct the needle towards the invisible uh, nerve and the nerve stimulation can help us confirm if the nerve is there. Our machine, our ultrasound machine, uses waves above the, the audible range. Uh, with frequencies over 20,000 hertz, like uh, bats and dolphins. The ultrasound machine has the ability to transform the electrical energy to mechanical sound energy and then back to electrical energy. The production of ultrasound waves and the detection of them is, is based on piezoelectric phenomena. What is this phenomenon? The piezoelectric crystals that are situated on, the, on our probe can be stressed or compressed upon application of high amplitude voltage depending on the polarity. So, when alternating current is applied on them, a cyclic changing of crystal dimension occurs, so we have vibrations, and those vibrations are transmitted in the form of pulsed sound waves. This way, ultrasound waves are generated. These exit the probe, they fall on the patient's tissue, and they are reflected back to the probe. Falling onto the piezoelectric crystals, they apply pressure and these crystals have the ability to again produce back alternating current. This current, this electrical energy is received, is processed, and an image is produced. So the wave source, the probe, the specific crystal, is also a wave receiver. What happens in the tissues now? The ultrasound waves, as they pass through the tissues, they are attenuated. They, they lose energy due to reflection, scattering, and absorption. In order to understand the reflection, and we have to understand what is the acoustic impedance. This is the opposition, the difficulty that the system poses to the passage of the ultrasound waves. So, when the ultrasound waves fall on, on the interface of tissues, on the border of, of tissues with a different acoustic impedance, they are reflected back to the probe. And the bigger the difference, the bigger the reflection. That is why when they pass from the a soft tissue layer towards a bone that has a high there is a high difference of acoustic impedance, we see bright white lines, and below the high reflective area that we'll see later, we see acoustic shadowing. Scattering occurs when the ultrasound waves have smaller wavelengths than the surface they strike upon. 
this way, the waves change orientation following random courses, random angles. And the small percentage of these waves is reflected, it is scattered back to the probe. A main example of a scattering surface is our non-smooth surfaces of organ parenchyma. So this, uh, this phenomenon, this scattering phenomenon, is responsible for the viewing of organ parenchyma, like in the picture. The absorption uh, uh, happens when part of the acoustic energy is transformed to heat as uh, the other sound waves pass through the tissues. It is a phenomenon that does not take any part in the imaging. Some resolution issues. Resolution, the analysis, is the ability to distinguish between two adjacent topics. We have axial resolution and lateral resolution. The axial resolution is the minimum distance of distinguishing two objects on the vertical axis, that means parallel to the ultrasound waves, like in the picture. It can be improved by increasing frequency. The lateral resolution is the minimum distance of distinguishing two objects on the horizontal axis, that means vertical to the ultrasound waves, like in the picture and can be increased with methods of better focusing on the desired depth. So, by placing the focus mark on the desired depth, the ultrasound machine uh, narrows the pulse beam and we improve lateral resolution. So, we can uh, increase analysis by using higher frequencies and using a focus, uh, the focus uh, application on the desired depth. The knowledge from the first two steps can be used meaningfully and uh, in, in, during workshops where we can practice. We can practice what we can see on our screen. We can see hyper-echo extractions that are structures that reflect strongly the ultrasound waves and appear, appear bright or brighter than the surrounding tissues, like bones, like uh, the pleura, like the diaphragm. We see hyper-echo extractions that do not reflect uh, so much the ultrasound waves, so they appear darker than the surrounding tissues, like, for example, the organ parenchyma. And we see anecho structures like the interior of, uh, of great vessels that do not reflect the ultrasound uh, waves at all and appear dark black on our screen. The nerve roots and part of the trunks of the brachial plexus uh, appear around or elliptical hypoechoic structures with a hyperechoic rim, like in the picture where we see the roots of the brachial plexus between the scalene muscles. They are dark inside with a hyperechoic exter exterior. The peripheral nerves of the upper and lower limbs usually they appear as hyperechoic structures with a hypoechoic interior, like bubbles, having a honeycomb appearance. Like in this picture, we see the median nerve in the forearm area. It's not always like that. For example, the ulnar nerve sometimes may appear hypoechoic. On the longitudinal axis, uh, the nerves appear as hyperechoic strips with multiple hypoechoic and hyperechoic lines within. The hyperechoic parts are usually, is usually a connective tissue, like the epineurium and the perineurium. The dark parts, the hyperechoic parts, are the actual axons. The vessels, as we already saw, appear dark on our screen, the greater vessels. At least, we can, we can differentiate between arteries and veins due to the fact that veins have thinner walls and they are more compressible, like in this picture. The muscles have a characteristic appearance of a hyperechoic uh, interior with hyperechoic parts that are connective tissues, and the bones, as we already said, have a hyperechoic rim and with acoustic shadow below because other sound waves are highly reflective by their surfaces. The color Doppler is a very important function of the ultrasound machine. It uses a Doppler phenomenon that is the change of sound wave frequency during the relative motion between the sound source and the sound receiver. The color shows the direction of the blood flow and not the vessel type. So when we see red, uh, it means that the, uh, the blood goes towards the probe. And when we see blue, uh, the blood goes away from the probe. It doesn't mean that red is artery. We can differentiate again arteries by veins due to compressibility of the veins and also due, uh, from pulsation of the arteries. An example here, we try to perform a supraclavicular axillary uh, brachial plexus block. This is the subclavian artery, and laterally to it is the plexus. And by using the Doppler uh, function, we see a small artery passing through uh, the plexus. If we cannot avoid it without needle, we should abort and use another approach to the plexus. The power Doppler has three to five times higher sensitivity than color Doppler. It is a function of newer machines. Uh, it is less dependent on the scanning angle and helps us see smaller and deeper vessels but gives no information on the direction and the speed of blood flow. 
a few things about artifacts that can be uh, sometimes annoying, sometimes useful. The acoustic shadowing, we already saw that. It, it is a significant reduction of the ultrasound energy below strongly reflective surfaces like bones and stones. It is a, a dark image below the high reflective areas. The reverberations artifact. They are equally spaced bright lines, like multiple copies of a dense structure, for example, a needle, um, caused by multiple reflections of the ultrasound waves uh, between dense reflectors. So dense reflectors can be uh, the walls of the, uh, of the needle. So some part of the waves, as they are reflecting back and forth into the, into the needle, return back to the probe and show us an image like multiple uh, needles below the original one. The acoustic enhancement is an intense echogenicity found behind objects that attenuate the sound waves less than the surrounding tissues, like in the picture uh, that, where we see a great vessel with an acoustic enhancement below or behind. Uh, it is caused by the fact that the machine overamplifies the signal and it can be troubling. For example, in, when we perform an axillary brachial plexus block, the, uh, the radial nerve may be hidden in this hyperechoic area behind the axillary artery. The mirror image is a double imaging of an object that is located on one side of a highly reflective uh, surface. Like here, for example, we see the femoral artery and its mirror image behind the fascia iliaca. The bayonet artifact is a velocity error. Uh, we see on our screen something like bending of our needle as it passes through, uh, uh, through different tissues. It happens due to a difference of wave velocity between uh, those tissues. The machine believes that all ultrasound waves have a, a velocity of 1,540 meters per, se per second, but the velocity is different between tissues and this bending of the knee appears on our screen. The cometail artifact appears deep to strongly reflective surfaces. It is a type of reverberation artifact without uh, the lines because the ultrasound waves are uh, reflected back and forth between anterior and posterior walls of a, of a subject, like here, for example, uh, uh, behind the uh, pleura. We see this comet tail sign uh, vertically below the pleura. In the workshops, but also uh, in our daily life, we can practice ergonomics. It is very important that it is the process of arranging our workspace to make our job easier, more comfortable and productive while aiming to reduce the physical stress, the pain sometimes, and resulting injuries associated with being a sonographer. The most important thing is that the operator must focus on the image on the monitor and also on the patients. So uh, this requires placing the screen at eye level on the opposite side of the operator, and the operator should, do, should uh, as well be able to easily gaze down to view his, her hands, probe, and the patient to align the visual and motor axis. Neutral posture is imperative. The neck should be at mostly flexed, never extended. For example, in this picture, uh, the position is bad. The, 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 the neck is extended, so it can be easily tired. The arm abduction should be less than 30. There should be limited radial uh, and ulnar deviation, if at all, and the limited, if at all, wrist flexion or extension. We see here a hyperflexion of the wrist. We see here a hyperextension of the wrist. We see here again hyperextension of the wrist, and here a, a bad position of both hands. The arm should be vertical at the body, and there should be limited shoulder flexion and extension. Otherwise, the, uh, the whole procedure may become difficult and painful sometimes. All this can be practiced in workshops. The neutral uh, wrist position uh, uh, gives its carpal tunnel space it, its widest form. In, in, this, uh, in this area, in, in this way, the tendons and the median nerve can gain the most amount of room in order to function properly. We should use the index most of the times, the index in the middle fingers from the one side of the probe and the thumb on the other side of the probe to keep it firmly but relaxed and the fourth and fifth digit stabilized on the patient's skin to prevent unintentional movements. The grip should be always relaxed. Otherwise, we get tired and we have a little pain in several parts of our uh, hand. I recommend our first needle not to take place on the patients. 
That's why phantoms are there. There are commercially found uh, phantoms. Sometimes you have phantom in a workspace, in a workplace. There are also uh, recipes in the, in the internet of homemade phantoms that simulate tissues and their interaction with the ultrasound. In phantoms, we can practice needling safely. There are two main ways to introduce our needle in relation to our probe. There is the in-plane technique, where the probe is inserted parallel to the long axis of the probe, so we can see it uh, continuously on our screen. And there is the out-of-plane technique, where the, uh, the, the needle is introduced vertically to the long axis of the probe, so we see just the needle shaft or the needle tip in cross-section as it passes below the probe. Again here, we see on the first picture the, uh, the needle, uh, how it seems when introduced in plane into the phantom, and in the second picture, how it seems when it is introduced out of plane. The in-plane technique is often the first one to be taught in novices. It is less complex and relatively safer, while the out-of-plane technique is more comfortable for the patients because, uh, if we see, the length of insertion is most of the times shorter, sometimes even three times shorter. And again, the uh, in-plane technique sometimes is not, so, uh, it's not always uh, easy to maintain complete needle visibility uh, during the whole procedure. For the in-plane technique, there are two ways to introduce a needle uh, relatively to our visual axis. There is the across and the along technique. With the across technique in the first picture, we introduce our needle across vertically to our visual axis, but again, um, parallel to the, axis of the, to the long axis of the probe. While in the second technique, we introduce, with the long axis, we introduce our needle parallel to our visual axis. This is an easier technique with an improved speed and accuracy. Uh, most studies for this are, apply, are performed in phantoms, but the principles hold true for actual patients as well. It is recommended for a newer uh, regional anesthesiologists. And additionally, uh, for beginners, it is recommended to use our needle with our dominant hand because we have to uh, be able to guide it thoroughly. Again, the across technique is in the first picture. And uh, in the second picture, we see the along uh, technique. I should mention that in these sketches, the probe handling is wrong. That is why I would like to remind you a relaxed grip with the thumb and the uh, middle and index fingers. Anisotropy. It is a property of structures to lose their ecogenicity, to sometimes disappear from our screen when the ultrasound waves do not fall perpendicularly on them. It is a function of tendons, of nerves, of muscles that vary as for the ultrasound appearance depending on the probe angle. For example, in this picture we see the biceps tendon when the ultrasound waves fall perpendicularly on it. And on the second uh, picture we see again the, or actually we don't see the biceps tendon when the degree of the waves is a little bit less, 15 degrees less than 90. Keeping this in mind, we have four main movements of the probe that we can use. The pressure, where we apply pressure on the probe against the skin to decrease the distance between, between the probe and the target and also to collapse the veins. We use alignment or else scanning where we slide our probe in order to find uh, the, um, the needle when we don't see it properly. We have the rotation movement where we uh, change the angling, the angling of, the, of, of our probe in order to see the whole uh, needle when we perform the in-plane technique, when we just see a part of the shaft. And the tilting, the changing of the angle of our probe, that is the most important movement we have to learn and practice in order to defeat anisotropy, to send our ultrasound waves perpendicularly on our anisotropic um, targets. There's one additional move, the rocking movement that we can use when the transducer footprint is larger than the body surface or where the body is not completely flat in order to avoid these types of images on our screen. How do we choose our probe? We have many probes. The main two types are the linear one and the curved one. The linear probe uh, uses higher frequencies most of the times. It has higher analysis uh, this way, but this higher analysis is uh, found only in most superficial structures, up to four centimeters depth. With a curved probe, we gain in depth, but we lose in analysis because it uses lower frequencies that 
uh, are uh, traveling deeper in the tissues. We have to know the anatomy of our probe. Knowing our probe, that is our main, our main tool, helps us use it better and protect it. Uh, behind the basalitic crystals, there is, a, there is a backing material situated that prevents excessive vibrations. So the ultrasound waves produced have higher uh, frequencies. So when our probe falls down all, all of the time, this packing material may break a little bit and uh, we cannot have um, proper frequencies. The matching material is situated between the piezoelectric crystals and the outside of the probe that stops the back reflection of the waves until uh, they exit the probe. And the, the green one actually in the actual probe is uh, gray. Uh, it, is a, it is a gray colored part attached to the tip of the probe that prevents the waves from spreading around, so focus them in one direction. We have to know that the phantoms have a low background echogenicity for several reasons. There are no any other organs there, so we have an enhanced needle visualization that makes things easy but may lead to false confidence. That is why cadaver workshops are there. Are there. They are traditionally connected to the core training of regional anesthesia. It is a very important step in uh, regional anesthesia training. They may help us learn sonar anatomy to practice our hand-eye coordination, to practice the probe handling on irregular, on actual irregular surfaces like in the supraclavicular region, and they help us practice needling and the alignment of probe and the, of the probe and the needle. Here there is a release of intracellular fluid. Uh, from the uh, in the cadavers that increases the fluid around the needle and enhances needle visibility. So it's not exactly the same as in real patients, but it is the most realistic practice, the closest possible to the actual patient. In cadaver workshops, the whole procedure can be followed: the identification of the target, the needle introduction, the facial penetration, the perineural injection, even an intraneural injection that should not uh, that uh, that we always try to avoid on real patients. Here we see. A femoral nerve, and here a femoral nerve where fluid has been introduced inside and the diameter has been increased. Major drawbacks of the cadaver workshops. Uh, the most important for me is the, that they are expensive workshops uh, for the attendees for sure, but also for the preparation and preservation of the cadavers. There are storage issues that limit their availability. Additionally, there is a distorted vascular anatomy that does not make the sonar anatomy of cadavers exactly the same as in uh, alive patients. There are some alternatives. There are meat phantoms that have good feasibility. They are cheap. They need minimal preparation and can be uh, easily disposed without legal issues. There are animal models. There are computer-based training programs that uh, help us uh, learn a lot, but uh, we, not, we do not improve procedural skills in them. And of course, there are synthetic models that are expensive and need special faculties. Should we use the internet resources? Of course, there is a vast uh, source of knowledge into the internet, but we just have to, uh, to choose wisely. Uh, there are e-learning platforms, there is Esra Academy, webinars like ours today, there are YouTube videos, there are social media, mobile applications. All these may cover the first two parts of the six step scale I mentioned. The several uh, uh, videos, like videos in YouTube, when just uh, wisely, may bridge the gap between the pre-procedural scanning and the needling and injection. We may have tips from experts. There are uh, things that are available 24-7. We, we, we may access them on a variety of devices, even from my mobile phones. And I recommend that short videos can be used as a refresher prior to performing a blog. I recommend to our tennis as well before performing uh, our first blocks to see a short video and also to practice in a, in a phantom uh, before uh, going to the real patient. After all this, most probably we are ready to apply our blocks under, of course, supervision. But what block to start with? Einstein said that any intelligent fool can make things bigger and more complex, but it takes a touch of genius to move in the opposite direction. That means to make things easy. This quote helps us avoid complexity bias, the notion that if it's complicated, it is better. In regional anesthesia, many new blocks are described all the time. There are new approaches, new names, and of course, with a low quality of evidence. We should start with easy things. That is why uh, the uh, Turbit and Associates, like uh, Clara Lobo said, uh, suggested a selection of high-value nerve blocks that every anesthesiologist should know. 
Later scaling and axillary brachial plexus blocks for upper uh, extremity uh, operations, the femoral adductor and popliteal blocks for lower extremity operations, and the erectospinal and rectus sheath blocks for the trunk. We can practice, we can learn this uh, uh, with a good way, and then uh, for and then we can we can go to more complex uh, blocks with um, uh, several other things. So. The top priority for all learning of regional anesthesia is the knowledge of the anatomy. And after having a good knowledge of the anatomy, we may go on with basic principles of sound physics, artifact formation, ergonomics, probe handling, hands-on workshops, needling uh, in phantoms, needling and practicing in cadaver workshops, and before applying our blocks on patients under expert supervision. Thank you very much and have a happy blocking life. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, that, that was uh, extremely well uh, laid out. Uh, there was a lot of information to digest for uh, trainees and everybody who is a regional anesthetist um, enthusiast and, and novice. Um, uh, we, we have one question. Um, I, I think both of you can answer it. Um, do you use the nerve stimulator at all? Do you teach with the nerve stimulator? Uh, I should answer to Clara. Um, you can go first and then Clara. Actually, as you know, uh, I don't use it very, uh, very often, but I'm trying to teach it. It, it. it should not go back to the drawer. It is very useful and I recommend to know how to use the NEF stimulator, even if we know the ultrasound machine, because it helps us uh, with deeper structures, like for example, the sciatic nerve. Uh, even if we are experienced, sometimes we, can, we cannot be sure that it's all that it's actually there. So uh, with a with a low uh, current, we can uh, we can be sure that what we see is actually there, that the nerve is there or not. So we should know it. I don't use it, but I trying to teach it. And also, I, uh, everything you said is correct, uh, um, Alexandros. But there's only one other aspect that we might should be be aware of is that um, in some areas of the world, uh, the the ultrasound is not a very easy access tool. So uh, why should uh, um, a patient be prevented of having the benefit of regional anesthesia if there is no ultrasound? Uh, there are techniques based on landmarks that are very useful and the techniques with the nerve stimulation that also uh, are uh, useful and uh, known for its effectiveness in the past. Yes. So I think I think this, it's a tool that should be taught as well. Okay, one more question. Do you use ultrasound for neuroaxial blocks? Okay. So the neuroaxial, the, the, the ultrasound for uh, teaching is also a good, a good tool. It has been proven to increase the success rate and accelerate the learning curve. Uh, it gives you a lot of information. And uh, also, I, I don't think you should also, also only reserve it for easy pa for uh, difficult patients. The easy patient uh, with the normal anatomy can give you uh, experience and can train your eye. Uh, to recognize the structures, so I think I think you should also use it as well. Mm -hmm. And one more, maybe for Alexandros, uh, comment on the success rate of landmark blocks where one can't use and or can't have access to ultrasound. Landmark without a nerve stimulator. Um, la, the paresthesia technique uh, is completely abandoned. It is not recommended uh, most of the times. But uh, the nerve stimulator techniques, when they are applied, have high in experienced hands, they have uh, high success rates. Be, uh, in our hospital, before uh, we had our first ultrasound machine, we had only nerve stimulators and we had good success rates. Uh, but uh, the nerve stimulator does not apply, for example, in fascial, fascial plane blocks. When it, when it can be used, it has high success rates, yes. Okay. And uh, one more. Um, is it recommended to, to use... Uh, uh, where is that question? Sorry. I think that was taken, taken off. Um, uh, 
I think I did it myself. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. so the it was... question is, do you use pressure measuring injection device yeah. at uh, your routine practice? Uh, well, I had it on my previous um, hospital. We used it uh, whenever possible. Uh, here, I don't use it, unfortunately, but there are other ways that you may use uh, more, you know, uh, con not unconventional way of measuring the pressure. Um, without a, a conventional um, uh, device. Um, it's useful, but, you know, it also has some uh, drawbacks or some uh, things that you should know because it really depends on the uh, who's injecting as well. Uh, the length of the uh, tubing that is associated, the gauge of the needle, and the size of the uh, of the knee, of the syringe and also you can have you can experience a high pressure and you may, it, but that doesn't mean that you are interfascicular it, may, it means that you are hitting some structure that can you know occlude the uh, the, the uh, exit site of the of the needle but i but if you have it i think you should use it as well mm -hmm. Is there a recommendation for minimum blocks per week in order to improve your learning curve as a as a, a regional anesthetist? Um, I think more than the number is the experience is the quality of teaching and learning. Uh, it's good to have a lot of, uh, of course, if you practice a lot, your uh, your learning curve will, will improve. But I don't think the proficiency should be based on the number of blocks you do. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, both of you. Um, it has been great. Um, this, um, just for, for our viewers, this was the first uh, webinar. We have three more um, in the following months uh, covering uh, the EDRA uh, exam and the Plan A blocks in more uh, detail. Uh, this webinar will be uploaded on the trainee coordinator, which is part of the trainee of the S. Uh, website uh, which will be available um, in a short time uh, for you to, to see. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and we hope to see you on our next webinar. And thank you Clara and Alexandros, you were thank amazing. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you too. Bye. Have a nice night.